everyone uh, in attendance this evening as we uh, continue our study of the book of Romans. We left off with the 26th verse of chapter 8 last week, so we'll start with the 27th verse uh, this week. Before we do, though, let's uh, have a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? And Father, we pray that they'll bless this study of ours, and we, we're grateful for this in this old dark and troubled world that there is this light of the gospel that lights our path through these times and on our way to, to heaven. So we're appreciative of thy wisdom that thou has left us, and we pray, Father, that each of us would study thy word diligently that we may incorporate it into our lives. And we're thankful for Jesus, whose sacrifice made all this possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> we had this kind of a, a long commentary on verse 26, but we'll, and I hope you remember that. But anyway, verse 27, he says, Now he who searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. As I said last week, uh, God is the great heart searcher. He knows our every thought, uh, purpose, and longing. Jeremiah recorded the Lord as saying, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways according to the fruit of his doings. That's probably a good scripture for David to have used. <clears throat> but what is the mind of the spirit? <clears throat> a mind uh, may refer to one's intellectual faculty, or mental disposition, or mood. And it would be unlikely that Paul uh, would make the mind of the spirit refer to the intellectual faculty or mental disposition or mood of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, chapter verse 6, <clears throat> Paul wrote, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Or as the ASV says, uh, The mind of the flesh is death, the mind of the spirit is life and peace. <clears throat> so the mind of the flesh is the uh, mental disposition or mood of the person dominated by the flesh. Contrarywise, the mind of the spirit is the mental disposition or mood of the person guided by the spirit according to the will of God. God who searches the heart knows the mental disposition, the feelings, and aspirations produced by the Spirit. <clears throat> now, what we just covered uh, in these last few chapters, uh, and admittedly is a difficult section to interpret and understand, and uh, Moses E. Lord, who had a commentary on Romans, and a very uh, astute individual, very scholarly individual, he perhaps uh, said uh, what should be an exercise in humility. He said the foregoing, not this, not just this one verse, but the uh, last few verses, the foregoing is submitted as the best solution at command of a passage which, by general consent of commentators, is difficult. <clears throat> As I wish I felt sure that the solution in every part is correct, but I do not. It is, however, the best discoverable, discoverable by me. When the reader has given the passage of thought which I have, then, but not before, he will be in a condition to be as distrustful as I am. <clears throat> well, in verse 28, uh, <clears throat> and we know, a very familiar passage to us all, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the, the called according to his purpose. 
Now, the the, the called, the the is not in the ASV. So it could be uh, to those who are called, like uh, Paul was a called apostle. And according to his uh, purpose, <clears throat> that comes from a Greek word, prothesis. And uh, it's the, the, the real root of that word is it's the showbread. In fact, in a number of places, it's translated showbread. It's a showbread as exposed or laid out before God. So the expressions, those who love God and the call according to his purpose are the same people. Now they are the ones who are led by the Spirit, Christians, God's children. <clears throat> so what are the all things, quote unquote, that are working together. <clears throat> Since all things is plural, uh, must be that some things are working in coordination with other things for good. Of course, there are some things that will not work with other things for any ultimate good, which is, uh, of course, we're looking for justification and salvation. <clears throat> As an example, perversion will not work with virtue uh, to bring about anything wholesome. So up to this point, Paul has spoken about what God has done and is doing for us. In all of God's dealings with men, Jews and Gentiles alike, he worked for their good, that is, their uh, justification and salvation. And he was successful. <clears throat> provided they loved him and were obedient to the system under which they lived, that is, were called. The all things then should be limited to the things that Paul has been talking about. As noted, the all things does not include together incongruent things, but it can include the adverse effects of life, its calamities, hardships, trials, and feeds as well as its pleasures, enjoyments, and triumphs. <clears throat> Regardless how it may appear in a moment, in their consequences, these things are not incongruent. For something to be good, it does not have to be pleasant. Romans 8, chapter verse 18. <clears throat> of course, some things can be pleasant without being good, such as the place, uh, passing pleasures of sin, Hebrews 11.25. And some things can be both pleasant as, and good, as the psalmist wrote in Psalms 133, verse 1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. <clears throat> this promise of good is guaranteed only to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Hardships may bring bring the loss to Christ. Well, if, if so, it was to their good. Otherwise, hardships and or pleasures do not work them good, either one. Well, how did Paul know these things? Well, he was an apostle who received knowledge through a revelation. But also, he's a highly educated, highly intelligent man. And he was endowed with uh, keen observational skills. <clears throat> no doubt it was a uh, revelation uh, reinforced by observation that he knew these things. So who are those who love God? Uh, well, quite simply, it is those who from the heart obey him. <clears throat> we read in John, the 14th chapter, verse 21. He who has my commandments and keep them, keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Furthermore, in 1 John, the 5th chapter, verse 3. 
says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. And once again, in 2 John 6, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Okay, who are the called? It is the gospel that calls men to obedience. Thessalonians 2 chapter verse 14. That is, it invites men to obedience. It is those who love God. Those who love God keep his commandments. Sometimes you know, the call is just limited to the invitation. You know, Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verse 14. For many are called, but the few are chosen. As used here, it refers to the invitation and the, the acceptance of the invitation. Accordingly, such persons could be called saints. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 2. Also in Jude 1, in the call of saints of, uh, at the beginning of the book of Romans, uh, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> Besides loving God, uh, good only works for those who are called according to the purpose of God. As we already mentioned, purpose comes from the Greek word prothesis, uh, which means a placing or setting before, and in this case it was a showbread, a setting forth, a presentation, an exposition, a determination, a plan, or a will. Strong defy, defines it thusly, a setting forth that is figuratively a proposal, intention, and specifically the showbread in the temple as exposed before God. In Matthew, the 12th chapter, verse 4, and Mark, 2nd chapter, verse 26, and Luke, 6th chapter, verse 4, it, it is translated as showbread <clears throat> because of the activity surrounding the showbread and the purpose to which it was dedicated. It, it acquired another meaning, that of our English word, purpose. Now, this is not an uncommon, uh, uncommon characteristic in the etymology of English words. <clears throat> Take, for example, the English word sincere. It comes from the Latin word sin, sincera, uh, which is translated without wax. Uh, the forgers of Latin times, uh, we wouldn't have that today, of course, uh, they would promote a forged object as genuine by disguising part of it with wax. Thus, the without wax object was just what it was portrayed to be. As we say at times in the vernacular, we just say that it's the genuine article or the real McCoy. <clears throat> but let's get back to prothesis. It involves purpose, uh, resolve, and design. A placing in view or openly displaying something a thought of purpose. This uh, placing or setting before is not before men, but before God, that is, before his mind to distinctly see him <clears throat> or see them. <clears throat> when purpose is spoken of as it is here, it always refers to salvation in some respect. So when was this purpose, uh, prothesis, first placed before the mind of God? <clears throat> well, when speaking of the eternal God and this to define a purpose for man, it is futile to speculate when the plan to redeem man entered his mind. A beginning cannot be assigned to that which is eternal. A beginning implies time. And there is no time in eternity. It just always was. All that can be said is that God had in his mind the whole human race 
in its entire destiny. <clears throat> uh, not only the entire human race, but each one that makes up that race, you, me, those who live before us, and those who will come after us from the beginning of creation until the end. Even in eternity, to which no time can be assigned, God has set before himself, uh, that is, purposed, the entire plan for the redemption of the souls of men. It was there in eternity that the Logos was foreordained for the foundation of the world to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. As is written in 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 20, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. There in eternity, the whole gospel was perfected. All that shall take place in it was completely before God's mind, or vision, if you will, as it will ever be when it is in the past. It was in the prophecies, accordingly, that each person was distinctly before God as saved or lost, as that person will be when the judgment is passed. Now, this is not because God has decreed that this man or the other should be saved or lost, since each one is free to choose his own destiny, but because he could clearly foresee what that destiny would be. Everything that is knowable or knowledge, God knows it. But it is an absurdity to assume that God must foreordain for what a man's destiny shall be to foresee it. God can't be limited in that way. God can as unerringly forecast the end of a perfectly free agent as he can that of a being to whom he is, uh, to whom his decree has left no volition whatsoever. If a man has no volition at all, then man is no more than a machine with no free will. Uh, is there so one so audacious uh, to deny that God can foresee the end as well as the beginning? Well, I, I suppose there are such people, but that still doesn't make it so. <clears throat> it is this complete view of the future uh, presented by the, this word, a prophecies, that enabled Paul to say so confidently that all things work together for the good of those who love God. And this also explains the clause called according to his purpose. In the prophecies, all things pertaining to man's redemption were set before God, in a manner of speaking. That is, he had it in his mind. And included in the all things was his predetermination that man should be called by the gospel. Uh, in 2 Timothy, the 13th chapter, verse 14, it reads there, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and the belief in the truth. Those are the qualifying uh, conditions for uh, being cho chosen for salvation. That is the predetermination. He goes on to say, to which he called you by the gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The prophecies is also spoken of by Paul in the Ephesian letter when he wrote Ephesians uh, first chapter, verse 11. In him we also, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, uh, purposes and prophecies. And in Ephesians the third chapter, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose, prophecies, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> Therefore, to be called according to the God's per uh, purpose, this prophecy, is to be called by the gospel. 
It is not some warm feeling or fire from the Holy Spirit that signals that uh, you are the one of the you are one of the elect, therefore saved. It is simply to be called by the hearing of the gospel. <clears throat> it is this call that we are free to accept or reject. By our free choice, we are saved or lost. And God knows what we'll, we'll do, but he doesn't force anybody one way or the other. <clears throat> In verse 29 of chapter 8, <clears throat> For whom he uh, uh, foreknew, he also predestined, and the ASV has foreordained, uh, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among uh, many brethren. <clears throat> <clears throat> to foreknow something is to know something prior to its realization. In this case, the foreknowing took place before creation. God has always foreknown the reality that would come to be. God foreknew every person that has existed or will exist from eternity, but the knowledge was long before their actual existence. Being limited in time, we cannot say when that was. Even to say long before is to assign a time, and in doing so is to limit eternity, which is both a theoretical and an actual impossibility. <clears throat> so let us say that in his uh, prophesis, that is purpose, God was not willing that any should perish, Second Peter the third chapter verse nine. So he predestined that the gospel would call sinners to repentance. <clears throat> He foreknew that certain persons would, of their own choice, obey the gospel and comply with the conditions of justification, thereby uh, being uh, to be saved from their sins. These are the persons that he foreknew. When they existed only in his purpose, the prophesis, they did, did, they did not exist in fact, that is, in the flesh, Still, all that God had done on their behalf was just as real to God as though they were, in, in fact, actual, real-life, fleshly persons. Uh, they would exist in the flesh someday, but they were in the prophecies of God from eternity. <clears throat> as was said, uh, he foreknew those who would obey his will, and it is these that he approved and accepted. Now, this is the idea set forth in Matthew, the 7th chapter, verse 23. <clears throat> and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, but depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Of course, Jesus knew the, who they were as personages, but he did not approve or accept them. Therefore, he says, I never knew you. <clears throat> God uh, predestined, or I like the word uh, pre predetermined. Uh, so he predetermined those whom he foreknew in his prophecies. And at the time of his prophecies, <clears throat> and again, we can't assign a time to that because that's to limit eternity. The persons he foreknew were the persons he foresaw would do his will. He did not foreknow the saved because he predetermined that they should obey him. Rather, in the matter of their in the matter of their obedience, he left them free to obey or not. He did not influence them one way or the other, except by the call of the gospel or by whatever law they were under. Those whom he foreknew that would be obedient, he pre predetermined that they should be conformed to the image of his son. Their obedience was not fixed by him by his act of predetermination, but his act of predetermination was brought about by their voluntary act of obedience. <clears throat> to be conformed to the image of his son uh, has in mind the resurrection. When he foresaw in his prophecies that certain persons would become his children, 
These he approved and accepted in his prothesis. He predetermined that those he approved and accepted would in the resurrection have the same glorified bodies as, uh, as that of his son. The, the obedient Jesus Christ was predetermined to be like men before he went into the tomb, that is, before his death. And the obedient men were predetermined to be like him when they come out of the grave. As he said by John, beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be like, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, First John, third chapter, verse uh, two. <clears throat> In all things, Christ is to have uh, preeminence. Here, uh, he is here accorded the honor and distinction of being the firstborn. As Paul wrote. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 18, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. <clears throat> For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on, are on earth, visible and invisible. With the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are, were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence uh, of, uh, have the preeminence, Colossians, again, first chapter 15 through 18. <clears throat> in verse 30, it reads, Moreover, whom he predestined, uh, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now we need to keep in mind here that Paul is still talking about the prophecies of God, but the things purposed are yet in the future, that is, uh, in the future of when God purposed. Those he predetermined to be conformed to the image of Christ, he called them in his prophecies. He called them either by the preaching of the prophets or some other righteous man or by the gospel. Uh, he called them in no other way or any special sense. There is nothing asserted or, nor implied uh, that he called some and not others. The difference in the call is that some voluntarily accepted the call while others willfully rejected it. God is no respecter of persons, so he called all men knowing in his prophecies that some would reject it. Those prophesistic persons, and I don't look at that word because I made it up, those prophesistic uh, persons he called uh, who in the free exercise, exercise of their will accepted the message. God justified them, and those he justified, he, glor he glorified in considering these uh, past few verses, it, it is an error to assume that an act of foreknowledge necessarily implies an act of an unarticled decree in a various respect of human life. And that the predicates of the section, including uh, called, justified, and glorified, are said of actual human beings. In talking about the processistical human beings, again, it's a word I made up. Uh, in the mind of God, that is, in the mind of God, uh, that's what he's talking about. Accordingly, uh, understanding the word prophesis is a clue to understanding this uh, section. In verse uh, 31, <clears throat> It reads, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, uh, who can be against us? Now, what things may be concluded from the things said about believers in the preceding few verses? Well, certainly we may rightly conclude that God is for us, uh, the faithful believer. 
if God is for us, who can defeat our justification, our glorification, except us? We may confidently say that Paul wrote, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. In verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? His own son, Jesus Christ, he did not spare. Now this was in, in accordance with his prophecies. He gave him up to suffer death on the cross to expiate our sins. As we live in the flesh, we deserve to die, to die for our sins. But Jesus died in our place. More than that, as the sinless Paschal Lamb, he died as a sin offering. Although Christ died for all mankind, uh, that is, his sacrifice benefited only those who obey him. Accordingly, according the all, uh, us all refers to the redeemed. So he freely gives us all things. The query is a, has a, uh, an argument from the lesser to the greater. God gave up his son to die for us. His son is his greatest and best gift. That being the case, he will certainly withhold nothing else from his children, the redeemed. <clears throat> what more can he give? Verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Now God's elect are not the prophecies, but the actual obedient ones. The elect are the ones who he has accepted and justified, justified because they have obeyed his son. Elect means to select because of obedience, not arbitrarily. Those who obey are elected. Those who don't are rejected. Obedience is not dependent, dependent on election. Election is dependent on obedience. Only God justifies a man can't do it. If uh, of one's on a card, uh, one may fall away, but a man cannot justify or condemn another. In verse uh, 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So who is it that uh, condemns God's chosen people? Well, no one can rightly do so. Our sins are the grounds for our condemnation, but Christ died to procure remission of our sins. He now sits at the right hand of God to make intercession for us. So again, the question, who is he who condemns us? It is not Christ, since he died for us, and now it makes intercession for us. Well, again, uh, there's no one we can only condemn ourselves. <clears throat> Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall, shall uh, tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, that our nakedness, or peril, or sword? Well, the response is no one can, nor can the adverse circumstances of life and flesh, which are common to us all. As Paul wrote uh, previously in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse uh, three through four, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. Paul said in verse 17, if we suffer with him, we shall be glorified with him. So these things enumerated here are intended to strengthen us 
and to serve as proof that uh, that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. As the writer of Hebrews said, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, a helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Hebrews 13, chapter verses 5 through 6. Verse 36, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now this is a direct quote from the 44th Psalm, verse 22, uh, which is thought to have been written during the Babylonian captivity. But be that as it may, the writer of this Psalm is referring to a great suffering. It is used here to refer to the suffering of these Christians to whom this epistle is addressed. The message seemed to be that the sufferings to which you are now experiencing is nothing extraordinary. Suffering has been the lot of the righteous for ages. All day from morning to night we are killed because of our fidelity and faithfulness uh, to uh, God. Persecution is so common that we are accounted merely as sheep ready for the slaughter. In verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, the, the words in these things are the things that we suffer. Sufferings are here depicted as a great battle that the faithful Christian uh, is a victor. Sufferings are temporal, whereas glory is eternal. We achieve this by the help given us by our Savior Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us, Ephesians 5, chapter verse 2. In verse 38 and 39, we'll consider them together. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this uh, <clears throat> confirms the preceding two verses. Uh, since he talks of these things uh, being unable to separate us from the love of God, indicates that the things enumerated uh, here are actually or conceivably hostile to Christians. Each of these items must be viewed in, the, in its adverse aspects, or at least in concept. For example, why would angels, if they be good angels, want to separate us from the love of God? They would not. It is merely hypothetical for illustrative purposes. It shows that nothing can cause the separation. Now, the gift of his son on the cross is the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now that ends uh, chapter 8, so the uh, apostle uh, now proceeds uh, to consider the case of the Jews more at length than he has yet done, and which he continues uh, through the, uh, the 9th, 10th, and 11th chapters. <clears throat> He first, however, strongly asserts the interest he feels in their, their welfare, mentioning things that honored and distinguished them. He vindicates God's dealings with them, especially his choices, which had affected them greatly. He shows that God had acted justly and in accordance with prophecy in rejecting so many of them and had done the same in receiving the Gentiles. He tells them that their great and fatal error was that they had not received Christ. Paul also brings out that God had at last rejected Israel and accepted the Gentiles. Uh, nothing could have been more offensive to the Jew than, than that. Paul makes the uh, this painful disclosure with the skill of 
of a master orator. It is, it is in his methodology and the conclusions to which the audience must uh, reach that precludes any possible object, objection that the Jew uh, could offer. So in verse 1 of chapter 9, he says, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. So Paul makes here a strong and emphatic declaration that what he is about to say is the solemn truth. He is saying that I speak the truth as in Christ and as accountable to him. Those who are in fellowship with Christ are under the most solemn obligation to speak the truth whenever, whenever they do speak. The uh, quote, uh, I am not lying, quote, unquote, merely emphasizes in a negative way the statement that I tell the truth. Paul's conscience was bearing him witness that he was not lying. And the Holy Spirit means open to its inspection. But what is conscience? <clears throat> uh, Nelson's Bible Dictionary has this to say about it. A person's inner awareness of conforming to the will of God or departing from it, resulting in either a sense of approval or condemnation. This, uh, the term does not appear in the Old Testament, uh, but the concept does. David, for example, was smitten in his heart because of his lack of trust in the power of God, 2 Samuel 24, chapter verse 10. But his guilt turned to joy when he sought the Lord's forgiveness, uh, Psalm 32. In the New Testament, the term conscience is found most frequently in the writings of the Apostle Paul. It was still uh, continuing from uh, Nelson's. Some people argue erroneously that conscience takes the place of the external law in the Old Testament. However, the conscience is not the ultimate standard of moral goodness, 1 Corinthians 4th chapter verse 4. Under both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the conscience must be formed by the will of God. The law given to Israel was inscribed on the hearts of believers, uh, Hebrews 8 chapter verse 10 and the 10th chapter verse 16. So, the sensitized conscience is able to discern God's judgment against sin. Now Romans the second chapter verses 14 and 15. The conscience of the believer has been cleansed by the work of Jesus Christ. So it no longer accuses and, it can, and condemns. Hebrews the ninth chapter verse 14 and the 10th chapter verse 22. Believers are to work to maintain pure consciences. They also must be careful not to encourage others to act against their consciences. To act contrary to the urging, urging of one's conscience is wrong, for actions that go against the conscience cannot arise out of faith. 1 Corinthians 8, chapter uh, in the 10th chapter, verse 22, 23 through 33. Verse 2, he says, For I have a great sorrow, sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Uh, given the context, Paul is saying that he has a great sorrow and grief on account of his countrymen, that is, his fellow Jews. His countrymen had repudiated Christ in this fact, caused him sorrow and grief. Uh, he will lead them to this uh, conclusion. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, For I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren and my countrymen according to the flesh. Well, Paul clearly considered the unbelieving Jews as accursed, uh, that is, condemned and uh, banished from the presence of God forever. Uh, but he doesn't say it outright, not yet anyway. Yeah, he is developing his point. Because of his affection for his countrymen, he could wish, but really he does not wish, that he was a curse from Christ in their stead. 
if he if it were possible for him to be accursed so that uh, they may be justified which it is not that does him no good and it still would not bring his kinsmen to christ this says something about paul in view of the persecution he endured at the hands of his uh, countrymen and uh, the next section is a pretty long section so or we'll stop here since it's the bottom of the hour and we'll start with verse four of chapter nine next week thank you